Well, hello, everybody. Good to see you guys uh, back in here for the return of uh, Three Up, Three Down in Season 4. Our premiere here today takes a look at the rules changes. Several of you guys have probably uh, taken a look at Dan Velt's video with Nick Karinji yesterday. They posted it on their Facebook Live page. And if you haven't, it's only about a 10 or 15 minute video to go in there and kind of get to understand some of the philosophy behind the rules changes. Uh, I'll touch base with a couple of the points that they would have made too. And then also try and put us into some situations to think about how exactly to apply those real situations here today. But thanks for joining us. Uh, it is great to see everyone here. This is obviously the first episode of uh, season four. Like I said, we'll take a look at rules changes today. Um, and then it'll be part of a series here that'll take a look at really kind of the big four that a lot of people have asked uh, for a rule study on. That is interference, obstruction, appeals and awards. So we'll leave things off here today uh, with uh, the rules changes. And then our next segment here, beginning next week, uh, we'll begin to go ahead and take a look at interference in a variety of different areas, uh, whether you batter's interference, umpire's interference, catcher's interference, all that kind of stuff. We're going to break them down category by category. And that'll take us, uh, as you can kind of imagine, and quite a bit of time to get through in each of those four, and I really want to break them down uh, and, and dive right into those thematic approaches. So I'm excited for that one and, and glad to have everyone on board. A couple of announcements here for me. Um, we'll continue to run three up, three down on, for Fridays. It'll be, like I said, a, a pretty long season here because we've got a lot of content to cover. Uh, it looks like kind of the only Friday that'll be off for us, so to speak, in terms of running would be the Good Friday weekend uh, headed into Easter weekend. So uh, that's something to look forward to and another really great piece here that I'm looking forward to talking about with everyone one and sharing some things uh, just to prepare us from the rules perspective uh, to get us ready then for obviously the upcoming season. Uh, the other thing that's out there for uh, us to help us get ready is Little League's virtual clinic series. Um, Tom Rawlings and men, many individuals out from uh, various parts of, of the country and even the international organization uh, will be getting together here beginning this Sunday, I believe, uh, to go ahead and uh, talk through a lot of the rules in a thematic approach, rule by rule. So uh, that'll be pretty good for everyone as well to try and prepare for the season and and trying to pair up um, what we're doing in three up, three down with what uh, what we see from those virtual clinics. So use the umpire registry to get uh, signed up for those. Um, and then you want to do so before the day that they're going to air. That way you don't get blocked out of the live meeting. So just make sure that you use the umpire registry uh, to go ahead and get signed up for those as well. Those are all the announcements that I've got here for us. Um, I'm not sure if Tom Rawlings has joined us here. I don't know if he's got anything else uh, for me. I'll let him butt in here if he does. Um, but nonetheless, here we'll go ahead and then uh, and get started here for us um, today. Like I mentioned, today's point of emphasis here happens to be on the rules changes, the significant rules changes for 2021. And if you listen to Dan Velt and Nick Karinji yesterday in their presentation, and you can check that one out on the Facebook Live, uh, Little League's Facebook page. Uh, but a lot of the changes that were made were just to afford some flexibility to local leagues to administer rules. And a lot of the changes, I think, make sense not only in terms of things that a lot of leagues had already been doing and filing waivers for, but in the COVID area and, and COVID era, excuse me, and trying to recover from COVID, uh, it kind of makes sense to see the different types of rules um, that had been brought about. Now, I've got two things that I basically want to do here with the rules changes. Um, uh, Gerard Takaguchi and a bunch of other great people from the West shared a document with me that I'm going to also share with you guys here today. It's kind of a quick reference and a couple things that I want to go ahead and highlight, we'll talk about those, kind of take any uh, general questions on there, and then take a look more so at uh, some situations that involve some of these significant changes. That way we can kind of think about uh, and practice applying those in any situations that we may see. So let me go ahead and share my screen here with you right now and just go through these rules. And as I'm going through them, uh, if you have anything, uh, please go ahead and um, uh, just just interrupt or, or ask a question, whatever it might be, because I'll lose sight of everybody here. So uh, as I'm going through stuff, if you would just kind of yell at me if you've got any questions or anything like that here. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, take a look here. Again, thanks to Gerard and, and the great people out West for sharing this document here with me. I've kind of got uh, highlighted here for us just what I want to go through. One of the biggest changes that I think you probably heard Dan Belt and Nick talk about yesterday were the revisions to mandatory play, which is the first highlight here. And as many of you guys have read, mandatory play now has been redefined as an at bat, as well as thinking about if that runner gets, if that batter gets on base, then he or she does have to uh, run the bases and score or be retired or whatever it might be. So we've added running the bases as a requirement then to mandatory play. And I've got a situation that I think will go through a lot of people's questions uh, regarding mandatory play. Uh, so we'll take that one here after we get into situations there too. So there's a brief little change there uh, to mandatory play. 
Uh, double headers have also been added. Um, many of you guys probably are, are working in leagues that may have some issues in finding field space. Uh, so this has now allowed people to go ahead and book um, in, in the minors, as you see here, uh, one double header, and then in the majors, two double headers per week. Uh, so that helps us to provide some flexibility for, for field usage, field rentals, whatever it might be. Um, the on-deck batter in the upper divisions is now in this position uh, closest to their dugouts. So no more like on a left-handed hitter, you're going behind the hitter. Even though that dugout is yours, you're standing, you're, you're going to have to stay right in front of the dugout. You can obviously move them uh, you know, down the line, so to speak, if you wanted to um, there. But nonetheless, the on-deck batter will occupy the position closest to the dugout. Remember, that on-deck batter is still just in the upper divisions of play. Okay, so minors and majors, no on-deck hitters. Um, we've also then got the ability to start with eight players or continue with eight players and see here that there is a league option to either skip the, that and just with no penalty, skip the ninth position with no penalty, or if the league option is there, um, they can go ahead and um, uh, take an out. So the leagues then are going to have to provide some guidance to their teams, to you guys, to umpires, as to whether or not the eight-player rule, when it comes into play, yes, we can play with eight, but then the question becomes, what are we going to do with the ninth spot in the order? And that is completely up for the leagues to determine. Um, and what I would do, at least at my plate conferences, is kind of confirm that in a situation in which you may only have eight players uh, at the start of a game or if you drop to eight players. I would just uh, take time to go ahead and clarify that one. Um, uh, with, in your pregame conference. Last two then to go ahead and take a look at uh, are the courtesy runner rules. Um, so this is for the regular season only. So courtesy runner is for the regular season on only. Can be used for the catcher or the pitcher of record. Uh, at least right now, that's how I'm interpreting it. Uh, probably need some clarification on both the courtesy runner and a little bit more um, on uh, substitution with regards to mandatory play. I think the rules committee will come out with something here in, our, in the very near future. Uh, but nonetheless, here for us, a courtesy runner, a player not in the batting order um, that uh, can be used to run for the pitcher or catcher with two outs, and they can do so in unlimited times. And if we're using the continuous batting order, as you see here, the person who made the last out becomes the courtesy runner. I would probably suggest we start with thinking about the, the, the um, uh, using this only for the pitcher or catcher of record um, for now. And then obviously that guidance or that clarification is probably going to be forthcoming um, from the rules committee sometime soon. So I don't want to speak on behalf of Little League, uh, just kind of the way I would think about it and to try and interpret it. And, you know, another thing to make sure that you probably clarify at your pregame conferences with your with your meetings at the plate meetings with those with those coaches is just making sure that we, we were consistent on this courtesy runner rule as well, reminding them that they can use it to obviously speed up the game uh, and, and then also just do something that makes sense in many different codes of baseball. But again, I would guess that the, the intent of this rule is for the, for the pitcher and catcher of record um, rather than a projected substitution for the next defensive half inning. Uh, but again, that guidance will still have to be forthcoming from Little League Baseball and the Rules Committee. Actually, that's what the rule says, Stu. The, stu the rule says for the pitcher, pitcher, catcher pitcher. and or pitcher of record. I got you. All right. I've read this way too many times, and I've got way too many basketball things bouncing in my head right now, too. So I appreciate it, that. It Mark. specifically says of record. Yep. And cool. the, other point, the other point that they made the other night was it's regular season only. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Regular season only. Thanks for chiming in there, Mark. Tony, so uh, would that be regular season only for the eight players as well? Um, you know, I do not. Uh, I, I know that's in the regular season part of the uh, the rule book. Um, I would have to revisit the tournament rules here for us. Has anybody else caught whether or not that is a, a regular season only? I, I, yeah, I didn't see it in there. I saw that because it's a league option. I assumed that was for the regular season. And I didn't see that's, any. That's what I would assume tournament. as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. just trying to get the clarification, though. But Yeah, that's my assumption, too, and it's it's on my list of things to ask in our next meeting, too, uh, to make sure that things are clarified and that everybody's on the same page. I would operate underneath a, a regular season only. Luckily, tournament's yeah. still down the, down the way for us, and we'll probably do something with tournament rules differences anyway uh, as we get closer. Um, we can now, obviously, uh, name our teams on May 15th, so they moved it up a, a month. Um, so we'll start thinking about tournament rules probably start of June, first week or two there in June. But I would treat then here um, the whole idea of the courtesy runner and then the eight player rule, uh, if you will, starting and continuing with eight as um, as regular season rules only until we hear, hear differently as we approach tournament rule. Anything else on things that I've covered here so far? I appreciate you guys uh, picking up there. All right, the last one then that I have to go ahead and go through is the intentional walk. Um, and this one just kind of makes sense. I, I think now what we can do is like if a batter comes in with a 2-0 and count and uh, they want to play strategy now and just walk him, 
Uh, they can walk that batter. He or she can be walked and waved to first base without the pitches, but we're still going to add the pitches to the pitch count. So if it's a 2-0 and o count, we're going to add then two more pitches to that pitcher's pitch count and then wave the runner or wave the batter, excuse me, onto first base. Okay, so that is uh, the deal there. Now that is kind of a snapshot of, I think, of the majority of the rules that we'll encounter. Uh, again, I would, at least in the early parts of the season, at your plate meetings and things like that, uh, really kind of dig into some of these rules changes just to make sure everybody's on the same page, especially in situations, because you never know what COVID uh, quarantine restrictions and things will look like uh, with regards to um, uh, the eight player rules to make sure everybody's on the same page there uh, the courtesy runner address that probably in your plate meetings too um, and then if you're playing nine and bat nine just reminding people of the mandatory play uh, rule rule as well any questions any comments there on on things that uh, I, I covered or anything that may not have been uh, covered in this brief little snapshot of um, of the rules that, that you guys found interesting or worth worth to note or point out anything else Stu, are you going to send that out so that we can print it and uh, distribute it locally? Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll put that like in the follow-up email here for us. Uh, I'll, I'll put that in a PDF. So I was working on it up, up until about noon today. So I uh, didn't get a chance to, to save it officially. But yeah, I'll get that one out to, to everybody. And again, that's not necessarily a Little League produced resource. So I don't want somebody to think that that is Little League's words. A lot of them are just copied and pasted, to be quite honest with you. But again, a great resource that many good folks out in the West put together. And they shared with me um, that I would be happy to go ahead and pass along. Uh, as long as, Gerard, if, if you're okay with that, too. I'll send out. When I send it out, I'll put a di disclaimer on there. Yep. Well, one one of the things though, to do this this year, it added a lot of local options, and I know we we had a, lo a discussion here locally <laughs> about local options and making sure that all that stuff is documented in your in the league's local rules before the season starts. These are not gentlemen agreement at the plates. These are not things that should mm -hmm. be changing from game to game or day to day. You know, they should be do all documented in the, in the league's local rules at the start of this before the season starts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just did ours here, and uh, I had actually checked with our uh, district UIC, and he ran it up to region because we had the question of can we implement them differently at different levels, mm -hmm. and uh, they all seem to say yeah. So like our our intermediate is going to take the out if you're short a player, but majors and below is not. So if you're working with your boards, at least that's the best guidance I've got is that you know, you can apply that, you can adopt those options a little differently at different levels. Yeah. Um, Matt dropped in the chat. The eight player rule doesn't list uh, as affecting any tournament rules uh, in the app. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Matt. I think everybody else is in agreement too. I'm just assuming that it means it will not be part of the tournament. And I'm sure the tournament committee and the rules committee will definitely add that point of clarification. But that is, uh, Matt, as you said, and everybody else has kind of chimed in how I'm operating, uh, mm -hmm. where the eight player rule is a regular season rule rather than a tournament rule. But we'll wait to hear for sure from the rules committee and the tournament committee as we approach the tournament season. Um, but Mark, Mark, you make a great point, uh, and Steve, you followed up with it too. You know, especially in our early rules and our early board meetings uh, as UICs or somebody like that. I think it's it's worthwhile to make sure that we get that stuff in, on print uh, and, and put in front of our coaches so that everybody knows that you know this is the way things are going. And rather than making gentlemen's agreements or what appear to be gentlemen's agreements at the plate conference. All we're doing is issuing reminders of things that people already have. Uh, and you don't have to do that every game, but I think it is probably worthwhile. And those are rules changes at the start of the season to talk about probably for about the first week or two. Uh, and, and again, just, you know, force your board to really make those public uh, and, and well known to the people that are uh, that are in charge, um, you know, of teams, obviously managers and coaches and umpires alike. Um, anything else on rules changes? things that I might have said that need clarification or touch base with or anything that you guys felt that was not in that rundown that would be worthwhile to share. Uh, Stu, you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Uh, on that mandatory play thing now, you know, there's always been that thing, like the starter doesn't have to reach mandatory play. You can put a seat. So how, is there any kind of change in, as far as the starter running the bases? He can be subbed out. You know, You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and I think, um, and, and I'll open this, I'll say what I have to say and then kind of open it up for other people to, to share what they may have heard uh, on down the line. Uh, but my, my the verdict that I've reached here on this is that, um, that the rules committee is going to have to issue some points of clarification because I think the rule is well-intentioned and it, it just kind of depends if you're a literal interpretation or a loose interpretation of the rule here, I think. And this is why the Rules Committee is probably going to have to issue some, some points of clarification here, too. But I think the purpose of this is to make sure that we're teaching people how to run the bases. 
Um, and, and we know that a starter does not have to meet mandatory play before being removed, um, which I would interpret as being able to to, to be subbed out or, or be pin, special pinch ran for in that situation. Uh, yep. Unless you guys are thinking differently. Um, and, and please chime in there. I, I, I would agree with you, Stu. I, I, I think uh, as long as he gets back in there and gets his at bat and runs the bases another time, he would then meet his mandatory play. Yeah, I asked that, I to very that seems to be the general consensus. On the, I asked that question on the Umpires of Little League new Facebook page, and the admins seem to reply that their uh, consensus is the starter can come out, but at some point during the game, he still has to get that base running requirement. The sub, however, cannot come out of the game until the sub has met all the requirements of mandatory play. Yeah. If he never gets on base again, how is he going to meet that? Well, going to going going to bat and making it out at bat counts as meeting your mandatory play for the base running is their interpretation of it. Right. Yeah, and they they the guidance is to treat it as an improper substitution. But again, if the starter does not have to meet mandatory play prior to being Before removed, moved. then I, I don't I have not seen that rule change. If anyone else has seen that one. That would basically mean that a starter, like in the top half of the first inning, if he or she reaches base, um, you know, like you guys said, we could special pinch run for him, but that individual would have to meet mandatory play at least some other time. And that would include being either retired at bat or running the bases. Um, if, I, if I'm a manager, I'm not, I'm not fighting that fire. Like, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not taking that chance. So. Uh, we got to keep track of that. Is that, is that the yeah. umpire's uh, duty to keep track of that? That's going to be a tough one in a regular, in a regular season game. That's going to be a, you know, a single man crew. That's going to be a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's where the that. are. Yeah. Scorekeepers would be used for. I'm going to uh, tell you the scorekeepers if there's, know. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. if there's uh, the scorekeepers the score are the, are the um, uh, either either the league validated scorekeepers or the coaches, and then you just have to get together and and understand what was done, and then you make a ruling based on that information that you have. Then the leagues are going to have to somehow train scorekeepers to, to mark that in a scorebook somehow, because we barely get, you know, you can half the scorekeepers barely can keep balls and strikes. Right. Mm -hmm. I do think that uh, that's, it's probably, you know, we've talked about preventative umpiring or proactive umpiring at the plate meeting. Uh, that's yeah. probably another thing to do is to check in with your scorekeepers on, on those rules too. And just make sure that you're working with them. Uh, Cause everybody's just going to have to make those changes. And um, yeah, I, I if I was a manager, like I said, and this would probably be if, if you are being asked as a local league umpire in chief mm -hmm. or something like that, I'd probably endorse, um, you know, saying, hey, don't 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 take the risk of it. Let, you know, Jimmy run the at bat here. Um, so I see a bunch of questions coming in that will probably be answered by these situations. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen again with everybody and uh, give us some situations here to go through, because, Eric, your question and things like that, uh, I think are definitely given to us here. So um I'm going to leave my screen like this just because I think everybody can see it. So here we go. Um, and when you guys can just chime in as to how this goes. Situation number one, obviously the batting order is right there on the screen for us. In the top of the first, Charles draws a walk. Visiting manager wants to use Smith, a substitute not currently in the batting order, as a special pinch runner for Charles. Is this permitted? I'll say yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Why? Not in the lineup. He's not in the batting order. It's, okay. the top of, it's the top of the first. Charles has other opportunities at some point during the game. So he's a starter. Mm -hmm. He's eligible to be removed for a special yep. return at this point. Yep. And and that's exactly how I, I think a lot of people are interpreting the rule. Again, I think this will probably need some clarification from the rules committee just to 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 point to just make it very clear, obviously, uh, to, to the rest of the population out there. But again, Charles is a starter. And again, a starter can be removed before meeting mandatory play, which then would be a, a yes to this question. Okay? And again, if that's wrong, I think that the, the rules committee will, will chime in and give us some type of point of clarification. Everybody good to go with situation one? Yep. All right. Situation two, in the top of the first, Daniel strikes out. Later in the top of the fourth, Daniel draws a walk, and the visiting manager wants to use Thomas, a substitute not currently in the batting order, as a special pinch runner. Is this permitted? Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, I think that one is is 100% the intent of the rule to get to allow mandatory play to teach us not only how to bat, but also how to run the bases uh, for these young men and women on there. So the answer here for for this situation, um, I would go with the yes. Let's take a look here at situation number three in the top of the first with two outs. Frank hits a double. Visiting manager wants to use Wilson, a substitute not currently in the batting order, as a courtesy runner for Frank. Is this permitted? Yes. 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 Frank's the catcher of record. Yep. And he, and it's also the top of the first here, right? So we're talking about a what? Starter. 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 Yep. You got it. And again, I, I just want to be very, very clear here uh, that, you know, the way that the rules committee has worded this rule, that's how I would interpret it, that the starter uh, can be removed before meeting mandatory play. And again, they may come out with points of clarification that may change that. So uh, just be aware and looking out for that one. And obviously Little League and everybody around Little League will try and get some points of clarification and, and emphasis out to everyone as, there as well. Situation number four, in the top of the first, Frank flies out to center field and then is retired. Later in the top of the third with two outs, Frank hits a double. The visiting manager wants to use Martin, a substitute not currently in the batting order, as a courtesy runner for Frank. Is this permitted? Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, very, very simple. Obviously, this is later in the game, uh, so he would have met mandatory play and everything else there. Very good. All righty. Situation number five. So, so Stu, though, would, would, the, would the mandatory play – Unless it's a substitute, the mandatory play wouldn't come into effect for any courtesy runner, correct? It, say that again, Tony. So unless it's a uh, substitute mm -hmm. that has just gotten on base and you, wanna, you, you want to um, uh, do a courtesy runner for him because he's yes. got to run the base, um, if it's anybody else, pitcher, uh, catcher can be substituted for regardless of mandatory play at that point. That, yes. And, and I think that is why the, the rules committee just kind of needs to issue that point of clarification for everybody. However, again, because the rule states that the, that a, that a starter does not have to meet mandatory play before being removed. then yes, we can special pinch run or courtesy run for them. Um, as long as they meet mandatory play at some other time. Right. The game. Right. Yep. And again, I would I would encourage you guys to be as preventative and proactive, uh, along with scorekeepers and game managers here. Uh, remember that there, there's the intent of the rule, and then there's strategy around it too. The intent of the rule again is to teach young men and women uh, all facets of the game: how to play defense, how to bat, and now how to run the bases too. Um, so even though there may be a little bit of a loophole in here, let's encourage uh, leagues here to to to, to abide by the intent. Um, and I get the strategy and things like that come into play, but here we're talking about the first inning or the first couple innings of play. You know, those, those kids can run the bases. Um, uh, so again, think about the intent. Again, officially we'll need clarification from the rules committee on this one. But again, because that rule has not been changed that a starter does not have to meet mandatory play before being removed, um, uh, then, then obviously he or she can be ran for uh, early on in the situations that we've given, been given. So I think one of the situations where it wouldn't, you couldn't do it would be, let's say, and this is assuming you're playing with nine players and not um, uh, continuous order. If uh, a substitute comes in in the fourth inning for the catcher, so now they've become the catcher of record, but it's their first at bat, they could not be removed for a courtesy runner. You got it because they'd be Correct? a substitute, right? You got to you got to get your mandatory play in that regards before they can be taken out. Yep, as two. a is, is, did I catch that right, Tony? Hey, yeah, so the substitute can, can, came in for the catcher yes. before the catcher batted, and now is at bat and gets on base. Mm -hmm. They could not be removed for a courtesy runner or a special pitch runner because they haven't met their mandatory play. Yep, Correct. you got it, Eric. Go ahead. Yeah, I can also help uh, help a little bit with this question. Uh, you are not the uh, you are not the catcher or pitcher of record until you have actually done one of those things on defense. Yes. So, uh, so oh, is that right? Okay. Have, yes. So if you have a a kid come in, so you have uh, uh, Frank is the catcher, and you have Wilson come in and pinch hit for him, and he gets on base. He is just a pinch hitter. He is yep. not. A, he is not the catcher of record until the following half inning, when he is out there actually catching. 
Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's a great point. Eric, thanks for picking up on that. Good work there, guys. All right, a couple more situations here for us to round us out. Bottom of the six. Whoops. Did we do this one already? Bottom of the six with one out and runners at first and third. The pitch, uh, the first pitch of the at bat to Carlson is a ball in the dirt. Runner at first, a steal second. Count now moves to one and oh. Uh, on Carlson with runners at second and third and one out. Defensive manager inform, informs the plate umpire that he wishes to intentionally walk Carlson. What do we do? Come on. Come on and add three. <laughs> what do you want and add three? Yep, wave him to first, add three. You got to add three to his pitch count. Yep. The easy one there, but again, that's one of the major changes here. Situation six, you take the field for the plate meeting with the managers of both teams. The manager of the visiting team informs you that he only has eight players present. Can you start the game? And when you, uh, what do you do when the ninth position comes up in the batting order? What was the league option? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, you can. Said. And league option. Yep, and league option. And again, for for those of us in positions of leadership, continue to uh, get in the ears of your president, of of your commissioners of leagues, and uh, make sure that this is clarified for everybody to know how this situation will unfold. That way, uh, as Mark mentioned, we're not making a gentleman's agreement. We need consistency in its enforcement uh, of the rule. Okay, so, yeah, we go, yes, we can play, and then it just depends on the league option. Either we're skipping the the, the uh, ninth position or uh, they're taking the out, and the leagues have that option. Similar question here in Situation 7. Top of the third, manager of the home team informs you that a player has to leave and that he will only have eight players to continue the game. Can you continue, and what do you do with the, that position in the order? Yes, you can, and league option. Yep, yes, you can, and league option. And again, just to make sure everybody's clear, whether you start with eight or nine, I think it's important for us to at least kind of in that plate meeting, just ask your, your coaches there, like, hey, how many are you starting with here today? And if they're starting with eight or nine, we address like this rule, nine, if this if this happens, um, or, or eight, obviously, uh, that, that's the way the situation is there. Uh, quick story about uh, the eight-player rule. Back in the fall, I was working a game, uh, and it was a team that had nine players. And uh, during the game, um, one, a player's mother got a text that both she and their son had tested positive for the coronavirus and as a result had to pull him from the game. Um, so I think that's one example here uh, of you know, just what we're, what we're dealing with in games here. And that's why it's so important at the plate meeting, whether there's eight or nine uh, players present for a team, that we have that conversation then at the plate meeting so that we all know how that how to address that situation moving forward. And again, consistency by league administration and their communication, really, really important here uh, to give us all a leg to stand on. Stu, one other thing that's not addressed by the rule specifically is what do you do if a team starts a game with eight and after the second inning, their ninth player shows up? Our league vote following the logic of the rule. Uh, we voted that regardless of where that player would normally be in the batting order, they're automatically inserted into that last batting spot. Yeah, so it, it, that goes back. I think there's a rule in, in four, or some, somewhere in four that you just add them to the end of the order. Uh, we're, we're definitely, yeah, going to allow that kid to play, right? Because especially in the regular season, we, we want um, kids to, to play and have the opportunity to play. So, yeah, we'll just add them right on in. What else? Any, anything else there, rules changes or anything like that that may be um, unsure here? Catching up with the chat. DJ, I see you, you active in the chat. Is there a situation that, that we need to address or talk about in the chat? Um, if you look in the 7.14B, um, it talks about how the courtesy runner cannot run for both the pitcher and catcher. And Matt was just asking um, if you're using continuous batting order um, and we're going by the last out, there's potential that you could run for the pitcher and catcher. Um, my interpretation is, is it's listed as an exception there in 7.14B um, and therefore it would remain um, no matter the situation, it would remain as the, uh, as the pitcher or the courtesy runner could be that person multiple times. And it's only because they're using CBO and not play nine bet nine. Right. Yeah, so basically here, so it, let me make sure I understand that the class, the, the, the rule here, so, or what it, the question is. So let's say here that the pitcher and catcher are batting like in the fifth and sixth spots in the order, and there's two outs, and, you know, both of them get on base. Can you courtesy run for both of them at the same time, I guess? Is that what people are asking? 
Um, here, I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, it's so a player whose name is not on the bat, team's batting order may not become a substitute runner for another member of the team. Neither the pitcher or the catcher are subject to removal of the lineup. The same courtesy runner may not for may not run for both the pitcher and the catcher at any time during the game. Okay. Unless you're using continuous batting order. Yeah. Exception. If the Curtis, if the, if CBO is used, the courtesy runner may be in the team's batting order and must be the last player in the batting order who made the last out. Okay. So again, we could have a situation where we have both the catcher and pitcher on base with two outs. Um, mm -hmm. Could you courtesy run for both of them? Yes, you can. I don't see anything in the rule that would prohibit that or prevent that from happening. I was just it just saying, can't I see the last can. I think the, the scenario that I think is trying to be addressed is okay. He he he, continue, he goes in as the courtesy runner for the pitcher, gets thrown out at second base, and then the catcher gets on base. And now you want a courtesy run for the catcher? Is that? What, yeah. Because it doesn't ain't say anything about like once per inning or anything like that. So I wouldn't see anything. And, and you guys are reading the rule here with me too. I wouldn't see anything in there that would prevent two courtesy runners basically from being on base for the pitcher and catcher of record. So long as you have enough as a speed out in the lineup. Right. Yep. So, okay. Well, cool. We kind of got deep into the situations there, which is good. I mean, I, I think understanding the rules changes, obviously they, they make their very uh, simple rules changes and ones that make sense. Uh, but, you know, just kind of thinking about number one strategy of how coaches may use them and then putting yourself into situations I think are, are very useful. Uh, and again, communication back with your league administration, especially at this point in the year, to uh, communicate that clearly and consistently with the staff of coaches and managers. And then you obviously taking advantage of making sure that that gets passed down to your umpires in that direction, too. And then in that plate meeting, be be proactive, be, pre, be preventative, excuse me, and making sure that everybody's on the same page here with these rules changes. Any questions for me over um, uh, or anything else on rules changes or anything like that that's unclear or that we need to address here or worthwhile talking about? Got one question on the the catcher, pitcher or catcher of their courtesy ran for. Mm -hmm. Are they considered to have met mandatory play at that point in time or at some point in the game? Can they not be courtesy ran for because they have to complete base running? I would say that if they are a starter, remember a starter does not have to meet mandatory play before being removed. However, if it's a substitute that comes in, he or she would have to run the bases and thereby could not be courtesy ran for, nor could they be a special pinch ran for. So if I, just for clarity, if I'm the catcher and I'm the eighth spot, third inning, I get walked, there's two outs, they can courtesy run for me. Come up in the, later in the game, fifth inning, same thing happens. There's two outs. You're saying I cannot be courtesy ran for at that point. Yeah, you, you have to meet mandatory play uh, at some point in the game as the starter. But it would because you're the starter, uh, you do not have to meet mandatory play before being removed, either for substitute, special pinch runner, or courtesy runner. So as an umpire, when do I not allow that player to leave the game after the third inning? In a yeah, game? yeah, because we're supposed to, yeah we're supposed to treat it as a um, as a as an illegal substitution. So what I would say to your point, Don, uh, is there like in the fifth where you know it's going to come to mandatory play? Uh, I would say I would probably stop that situation because again in the rule book it does tell us to treat it as a, an um, an improper substitution in which we would just deny that that substitution for the courtesy runner or the special pinch runner. And we have everything in the arsenal to in, to to do to make sure uh, players meet mandatory play. So I would, I would absolutely, and this is why we got to work with our scorekeepers and uh, really why it's so important at the plate meeting that we handle this to make sure that, you know, all, all bases are covered, so to speak, with the meeting mandatory play and that everybody is on the same page that mandatory play is, is the priority over strategy or anything else. Would you follow the logic from postseason where you simply don't allow coaches to make substitutions. If you know, if you've got a player has not been in the game within the last two innings, they must put that player in Correct. so they can get their at bat. So if you've got a runner that you know has not, well, they haven't they haven't had a legal at bat. I assume they've had. If they haven't had a legal at bat and they haven't had a chance to run the bases, if you're within nine outs of the end of the game, mm -hmm. you probably wouldn't allow that substitution. Absolutely. Yep. One hundred percent. Yeah. 
All righty. Well, I'll get ready to wrap things up and then we can stay after and talk for anyone else uh, that, that would like to do so. Uh, we'll meet again next week. I may have to move our, our, um, our meeting up to Thursday. I'll think about what exactly to do, or there may be a, a guest in to lead our conversation on Friday. I've got a medical procedure early in the morning uh, that I got to be put under for and uh, hopefully I'm, I'm back and ready to go by 1230, but I, I wouldn't bank on that one. Um, so just be on the lookout for some communication. It'll either be next Thursday or next Friday, one of the two, depending on people's availability uh, and what things look like. We'll go ahead and start with interference next week. So uh, we'll get deep into it. I'm going to break that down into different categories. Uh, umpire interference, batter interference, batter runner interference, runners interference. Uh, and that way we can just be clear on number one, what the criteria of interference is and take a look at specific context and situations as well. Uh, I've got a bunch of rules questions too that pertain to each of those that I'll send out at the end of our uh, calls on each of those uh, as a review to see uh us apply what exactly we learned. But I'm really excited about um, the, the future here uh, of what we're doing here in 3 Up, 3 Down uh, with regards to the rules situations here so that we can continue to pre prepare for the upcoming season. Uh, and again, remember that we'll either be Thursday or Friday next week. I'll have that communication out to you sometime soon. Uh, and then lastly, please make sure here that uh, if the, you are interested in the virtual clinics put on by Little League, that you register for those as soon as possible. I would just register for all of them in your umpire registry uh, for for each of the rules and that way you don't get blocked out the day of because for whatever reason the day of uh, you're not able to register them for them so i would go ahead and go into the umpire registry and get things then taken care of there okay um, I'll uh, go ahead and send out a couple things. I'll send out uh, that handout from Gerard and, and good folks out in the West over the significant rules changes. Again, that's something that volunteers put together, not exactly something that Little League uh, put together themselves, uh, but it is pretty much copied and pasted uh, all at the same time. So I'll have that one out there for you. Probably um, uh, go ahead and share some tips for studying the rule book as well, working on putting that here together. Other than that, everyone, thank you for being here. Hope to see everybody again next week. Uh, stay safe and warm to everybody here battling the winter weather. Uh, we'll hold on here and have a conversation uh, in, in the post meeting as well if you guys are interested. But other than that, guys, have a great weekend, and I'll see everybody next week. Thanks for being here.